Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior and accomplished marketing and advertising professional from the UK, Mr. Rory Sutherland. Rory, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great privilege. Thank you. Rory is the, thank you. Rory is the Vice Chairman of Ogilvy UK. He's an author, and all of you know I'm very partial to authors. He's an author of a book titled Alchemy, The Pow- Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. So, Rory, before we get into advertising, tell me about your journey in the world of advertising. Um, to be honest, I probably went into advertising for slightly venal reasons. Mm-hmm. In the, when I left university, I was a classicist at university. Wow. I couldn't see that many jobs which were both um, – pretty interesting and reasonably lucrative you know i didn't have much money to begin with and so i wasn't completely blind to uh, the need to make some money but at the same time i didn't want to go into something like banking um, mm. or consultancy which seemed to be unbelievably arid and dry and in any case didn't really play to my strengths mm. and um so i applied to a variety of advertising agencies back in 1988 i suppose 87 88 mm-hmm. and ended up partly by chance, um, partly by design, I think, at Ogilvy and Mather Direct, yep. as it was then called, mm-hmm. which was the direct marketing arm mm-hmm. of the Ogilvy empire. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but David Ogilvy had always said that anybody wishing to be a copywriter or creative should spend the, their first four years in direct marketing, okay. learning what actually works. Mm-hmm. And there was that fundamentally interesting thing Um, which has a direct link to my interest in behavioral economics, Mm. which is when you could test and measure Mm. um, uh, relative creative approaches or indeed relative targeting approaches or whatever you wish, actually, (laughs) um, you very rapidly learned that the way people make decisions um, bears very little relation to how economists think they should make decisions. Correct. Um, I don't think, by the way, I don't think it is irrational for people to decide as they do. For the most Mm -hmm. part, I think when you dig a little deeper and look at second order effects, I think things like brand preference Mm -hmm. are actually instincts which we all share for actually very good reasons, which is when in doubt, buy from someone who has a reputation to lose Mm -hmm. or what Nassim Taleb would call skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot of what what consumers do is actually much more intelligent than they realize Mm. um, because they're relying on instincts which, you know, over a million years of evolution have been fairly well honed as to who you should trust and who you shouldn't. Correct. Um, But quite often, I think, uh, quite often economists will go in. And of course, the standard neoliberal economic model assumes perfect trust, perfect information, Mm. stable preferences. Correct. Uh, All three of those things don't exist in the real world, by Mm. the way. Mm. Well said. Well said. So now let me, before I get into branding and marketing, let me first start with your book, Uh, Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. And I'm going to ask all our viewers and listeners to go and check out Rory Sutherland's book. I'll go and check it out myself. So Rory, tell me a little bit about your book and what was your hypothesis when you decided to write it? Um. It came, I think, from concern Mm -hmm. that I spent quite a lot of my working life, and this was a product of being in direct marketing. You didn't so much work with the enlightened companies like Unilever, Mm -hmm. who all collectively understood the value of marketing. You tended to be working with brands and companies that had a very strong financial focus, a very strong technical or engineering focus, for example, And I always noticed that the marketing people in those organizations were particularly beleaguered Mm. because they were surrounded by people who were, and probably quite rightly, making rational, optimal, single right answer decisions. Correct. And they were in a field where effectively there is no single right answer. As I say, the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. (laughs) They're working actually in the field of complex systems rather than in the field of engineered reductionist mechanistic systems. Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful quote from 
a, a countryman of yours, actually, Kumal Galhotra, who's now the head of Ford North America, mm. who describes it beautifully by saying that car making is a hundred thousand rational decisions mm. in search of one emotional decision. <laughs> well said, yes. and it's very easy to forget that you can get every aspect of the engineering right. Correct. But if people don't want to buy the car, what you've done is every single piece of that effort is wasted. Yep. Yep. And I think what I realized is that psychology and the role it plays in the success of business um, deserve to be significantly elevated, mm. particularly in a world which is mostly not driven by scarcity. Mm. You know, most, most economic thinking is effectively predicated on scarcity, mm. but in large swathes of the world, actually, you can't really refer to scarcity as being the driving force, nor are people spending most of their money on staples. Mm. Mm. And it struck me that in those circumstances, um, we need to understand that actually marketing, which has often been sold as the icing on the cake, mm. uh, is in fact the cake. And I think we've made a mistake as advertising practitioners by selling marketing as a kind of an advertising as an optional extra. You know, it makes good things just a little bit better. Mm. Okay. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think it's actually um, central to business strategy. Mm. And actually, it's not an optional extra. It's not the heated steering wheel of mm. the business services world. Um, it's something which, if you neglect it, the consequences are fatal. Mm. Never mind the fact that actually, if you do it well, yes, you will do considerably better. Mm. But there's a there's a corresponding side which we don't talk about very much because we're usually saying do this and things will be good. Mm. If you get your marketing significantly wrong because mm. you treat humans as being um, what you might call kind of rational construct or mm -hmm. the single representative agent. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that can be absolutely disastrous for businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. Uh, you also say that, you know, to be brilliant, you have to be irrational. Yeah. Um, help me understand this and please give me an example. Uh, very simply, um, at the very least, I mean, you can incrementally improve things. I'm not disputing that. You know, mm. you know um, the thing to understand here, I think, in business is that um, all big data comes from the same place, the past. Mm. Okay? Yep. And unless you can safely assume two things, one, that the data you have is entirely representative, mm -hmm. that you know every variable that needs to be known, Mm -hmm. and that the future is going to be very, very similar to the past. Mm -hmm. Unless you can make those three assumptions, modeling what you do on the future, in the future, on data you've actually um, uh, derived from the past, mm -hmm. is in the medium to long term, mm -hmm. to be honest, if, if you're, all you're interested in is your short term career, that's probably what you should do. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not good for your employer, but it's probably good for your employment. Mm -hmm. Okay, because no one ever gets fired for being rational. Correct. Okay. However, if you want to do something significantly new, mm -hmm. what you have to do is it requires not just deduction and induction. It requires something which I think um, a brilliant writer who you must have in your podcast, um, uh, Roger L. Martin, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, he would call this uh, abductive inference mm -hmm. by reference to a philosopher called Charles Sanders Peirce. It requires some degree of speculative or imaginative um, consideration. Mm -hmm. And so an example of this, I, I give the perfect example, I think. Uh, if you take Nespresso, which is possibly Nestle's, one of Nestle's most valuable brands, mm -hmm. um, you could say the same about Dyson. There was absolutely no pre-existing evidence mm -hmm. In fact, quite the contrary, that there was a market for a cup of coffee costing 70 pence mm. or 70 cents that mm. people made themselves at home. Yep. There was absolutely no prior evidence that there was a market for a vacuum cleaner costing 900 US dollars. Correct. Okay. Or for that matter, an apple. Oh, for, no, absolutely right. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. if you look at a pre-existing market, if you look yeah. at the vacuum cleaner market, you would have said, OK, you have Miele at the top end. OK, you have... You know, utilitarian, fairly basic vacuum cleaners at the bottom end. There's a kind of bell curve in effect, which is this is where the middle of the market sits. OK, absolutely zero evidence that there, mm. there was the possibility of a significant outlier. Correct. Correct. However, 
Okay, <laughs> this is this is making it, uh, it, actually it's worse than that mm -hmm. because even I would have said to James Dyson, I would have said, "Look, let's be frank, mate. Okay, a vacuum cleaner is a distressed purchase. Mm -hmm. Okay, in richer homes, the owner of the home probably doesn't use a vacuum cleaner themselves. Correct." Anybody who's going to buy an $800 vacuum cleaner almost certainly doesn't clean their own home, mm. okay? And it's a distressed purchase. You know, mm. there isn't much scope for premiumization in distressed purchases. You only buy one if your old one breaks. No mm. one goes buying vacuum cleaners for fun, I would have said, you know, yes. okay? It's not like the fashion industry, okay? Mm. And yet, actually, I was wrong about all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's why James Dyson is a billionaire and I'm not. Correct. <laughs> um, and I always joke, he said, if James Dyson had then said, I hear what you're saying, Rory, but wait till I tell you about my $400 hairdryer, mm. I would have said, okay, <laughs> security, <laughs> okay, get this lunatic out of the building. Yes. And so to some extent, um, it's rather like that phrase, which is a sport that neither Indians nor Brits know much about ice hockey. Okay. Right. Yes. But Wayne Gretzky said the secret is to hit the puck where it's going to be, oh. not where it is. Correct. Okay. And everything actually requires an, an element of speculation, anticipation, mm. trend spotting, whatever it may be. Mm. But the pre existing evidence, or to put it another way, if we demand mm. um, complete rationality, of a future proposal, mm. we're massively limiting the opportunities for creativity mm. and innovation. And I, the way I phrase this in a single sentence is because there are far more good ideas you can post rationalize than mm. there are good ideas you can pre rationalize. Mm. And therefore, of, of your solution set, the ideas that make sense in advance mm. are a subset and a comparatively uninteresting subset mm. of the set of all potential ideas. Mm. Well, now, you can understand why people want to make sense, because as John Maynard Keynes said, worldly wisdom teaches that it is often better for the reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. Brilliant. And he also made the point, which is equally pertinent, which is people would often prefer to be precisely wrong than mm. vaguely right. And so the appeal of these economic yeah. and mathematical models mm. is their precision. But the precision is really illusory and comes at an extraordinary price, mm. which, of course, the price, the price you pay for precision is invisible, but it's really opportunity cost. Mm. And that's the phrase I'd always use, which I think is a problem for all businesses, which is it's much, much easier to measure and cut costs than it is to measure opportunity costs. Well said, yeah. That's it. And by the way, by the way, th there is maths behind this. By mm -hmm. the way. There's mm -hmm. maths behind creativity. Okay. And the maths is what's called in algorithmic thinking in AI, for example, mm -hmm. it's called the explore exploit trade off. Mm -hmm. And in any dynamic system, in other words, where the environment is changing, which obviously includes markets, mm -hmm. and obviously includes, by the way, human psychology as well, which is patently a complex system. Mm -hmm. Okay, the human brain, if anything in the universe is complex, it's that. Okay. Um, uh, you have to make a trade off between exploiting what you already know, mm -hmm. and are confident about, mm -hmm. and exploring what you may be wrong about what you don't yet know, mm -hmm. or exploring what is no longer true about what you think you know. Mm. Now, the example of this manifested in nature is in bees, where 80%, it, it obviously varies depending on circumstances, mm -hmm. but 80% of bees basically obey the waggle dance. Mm. They go to where the hive, the hive mind, the collective hive knows there is nectar and pollen. And there's one other thing they collect, possibly water. Okay, mm -hmm. they go to known sources of revenue, as it were. Okay, mm -hmm. but 20% of the bees go off at random. Now, in the short term, mm -hmm. you would look like a more efficient hive if 100% of the bees obeyed the waggle dance. Mm -hmm. okay. The downside is that several things happen. One, you can't grow mm -hmm. because your business is entirely dependent on what you might call sources of revenue you're already aware of. Mm -hmm. so you never discover any new sources of revenue. Okay. Secondly, what actually happens, and this is why evolution got rid of the hives where everybody obeyed the waggle dance, mm -hmm. is that if the if circumstances change, you're over optimized on the past, you're trapped in a local maximum. Mm -hmm. And let's say some cows break into your favorite field and eat all the flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, effectively, it's extinction. It's an extinction mm -hmm. event. Mm 
And so nature always makes a trade off between what you might call um, exploiting what you know mm -hmm. and intelligent variation. Very interesting. Well said. Okay. And by the way, it'll vary what, yeah. what that ratio yeah. is. We, we, we need to have a debate about the, re, 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 about the ratio. And by the way, there are probably some organizations where, well, I'll give you an example, okay? When I fly to Los Angeles on Sunday, I don't want to think that the people checking the wheel nuts on the plane are mm. wildly experimental mm. people, okay? Mm. That's an area where you want very, very little variation mm. because the downside consequences are far worse than the mm. upside gain. Yep. But... It, the ratio is almost never 100 nil in favor of exploitation. Mm. And I think it's, it's really, really important because obviously what we need is different business metrics for the explore part of the business mm. versus the exploit part of the business. Mm. And whereas the exploit part of the business can be short termist mm. its consideration. And that might include things like performance marketing, by the way. Mm. Okay. Or, um, conversion optimization. Mm. You know, you know those things. Those things can be relatively short termist, and you know, uh, you can pretty quickly optimize them, mm. um, and, and you can demand short term results. Mm. Very interesting. Brand so, building, on the hand, brand yeah. building is effectively an exploratory and probabilistic. Correct. Activity, Correct. So, where you say we can't know who all our customers are in future. So the best thing we can do is make ourselves famous enough that they come to us. Mm. Okay? Mm. okay. Um yeah. So so what what I want, you know, what I wanted to do was, you know, I've, I've been I was reading about you and there's some fascinating quotations that you've given. So I'm going to quote you and then ask you a question. You say a flower is simply a weed with an advertising budget. Absolutely. And therefore my question to you is what goes into building a successful brand? Um, I think we need to be very, um, uh, one of the things that worries me is that brands are massively underrated in their importance, because Correct. the way we talk about brands tends to be Unilever, VP and G, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. uh, L LG versus Samsung in the yep. field of televisions, okay. Mm -hmm. And there, what we tend to talk about is fairly hair splitting distinctions mm. between two televisions or two shampoos, which are both already pretty good. Correct. Okay. Now, obviously, it's important to PNG and it's important to Unilever that they win that particular battle. Mm. But that isn't the primary value of brands mm. because brands are actually essential to free market capitalism mm. because they're the unit of selection by which consumers punish just bad actors mm. and reward product superiority. Mm. So where you have the Soviet Union, where brands were deemed to be un-Marxist and therefore ideologically unacceptable, mm. okay? Mm. And you would go into a bread shop and it, would be, it wouldn't be so-and-so's bread shop PTE, it mm -hmm. would be bread shop number 247, Moscow. Correct. And you'd yeah. go in and on the store, it would be labeled bread, mm. okay? Now, if you had a particularly good loaf of bread, there was no way of replicating that experience. Mm. And if you had a particularly crappy loaf of bread, there was no way of avoiding that in the future. Yeah. So without that unit of selection, there was no way in which products could improve mm. or people could discover mm. untapped consumer needs. Mm. And actually, this manifested itself where in shipbuilding, for example, mm. lots of people were producing rivets and some of the factories produced better rivets than others. Mm. OK, but there was no incentive to produce better rivets because nobody knew where the rivets came from and you wouldn't get any more business producing good rivets than you were producing crap rivets yeah and much much to the discomfort of the soviets mm. because they realized this conflicted with marxist ideology mm. they ended up forcing the factory the rivet factories to stamp their initials on the rivets they made mm. so there was some sort of feedback mechanism <laughs> yeah that's one area the second area is that your investment in your reputation is a commitment device. Mm. It is much, much more costly for Samsung to sell a bad television mm. because the reputational damage is far more costly than the short term revenue gain. Mm. Whereas someone you've never heard of, a television brand you've never heard of being sold, let's say on the street mm. rather than by a retailer, mm. okay, 
it's the difference between what you might call relational capitalism and transactional mm -hmm. capitalism. Right. Yeah. The unbranded television is going to be cheaper. It's going mm. to be bought, bought on the street. So mm. you're not paying the retailers overheads. Mm. But equally, you don't have the commitment to reputation and to mm. futurity mm. and to future trust that the brand and the established rooted retailer both mm. have. Well said. And therefore, the likelihood, to be honest, seven times out of eight maybe actually the cheaper television is better value for money mm. okay mm. but the chance that the television is terrible mm. which is what by the way the human brain is really trying to avoid mm. yes we talk about this is a bit better than yeah. that but a large part of our brain is effectively engaged unconsciously in catastrophe avoidance mm. and you basically know if i buy a samsung television from john lewis mm. it's going to be somewhere between okay and great mm. If I buy a random television unbranded from someone I've never met before at a car boot sale, it could be great, but it could be absolutely Correct. abominable. Correct. And I'm not willing to take the downside risk. Mm. So brands are, if, if you like, a degree of consumer insurance. Yeah, well said. Well not, said. A, not a guarantee of perfection, but mm. a reliable... I always say of McDonald's, McDonald's yeah. is the most successful restaurant chain in the world, mm. not because it's very, very good, but it's incredibly good at not being Consist very bad. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You also say, Rory, that don't just copy what works, copy how it works. And yeah. my question to you here is you gave the example of PNG and Unilever. Companies like that have brands that have succeeded, that have survived a hundred years. Well, others die in a few years. What do brands do to stay relevant for a long period of time? I mean, I suppose possibly the most extraordinary case, if you're an, um, I always refer to myself as a bit of a brand naturalist in mm -hmm. that, you know, I, in a sense, Darwin's mindset is mm. my model, which is you go around looking at things that are anomalous, even that are surprisingly trivial, mm. and you ask yourself why. Mm. And so one of the important things I think is, which I think makes marketing different from the mainstream business is mainstream mm -hmm. business has a sense of proportion. Mm -hmm. Big interventions have big effects, small interventions mm -hmm. have small effects. Mm -hmm. In marketing, because it's psychological and it's a complex system, actually a trivial thing can make an immense emotional difference. Mm -hmm. It's rather like being greeted by name mm -hmm. in a bar. Correct. You know, okay, it costs nothing, it's mm -hmm. totally trivial, but it completely changes your emotional um, uh, uh, state when you go into that bar. Mm. And so um, the first thing is I look at I look at trivial things as well as big things. And mm. I suppose the most one of the most interesting ones is the success of Tide mm. as a laundry detergent in yep. the United States, mm. where the market share is kind of insane. I mean, mm. it, 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 it kind of defies all logic uh, in a way. Yeah. Um, I think um, one of the things is simply continuing to advertise. Mm. Because I think consumers infer from your ad spend. Mm. This is why um, when I say a flower is a weed with an advertising budget, mm. the costliness of the decoration mm. is part of the value of the communication. Mm. Okay. Because um, with, with a few exceptions, orchids, for example, are often highly deceptive. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's some evidence that there are flowers that close their petals when they don't have any nectar to deliver Correct. because they don't want to make a false promise to the to the insects. Mm. Okay, and there's also evidence that the size of the flower is proportionate to the amount of nectar available. Correct. And so it's um, it's not worth investing in advertising if you're going to under promise because the single shot exchange doesn't pay for the cost of advertising mm -hmm. your advertising only pays if it leads to repeat custom mm -hmm. and therefore money invested in advertising is pr proof of your commitment to futurity mm -hmm. and your future long-term intentions towards customer satisfaction mm -hmm. well said it's game theory really yeah. i mean it, it, i agree it, it, yeah. yeah i agree i agree with you rody you also say uh, and i'm going to come to digital marketing now you say bet on the jockey and, you know, I remember 40 years ago when I was, uh, you know, in starting off life in marketing and finance and so on, uh, there used to be this, you know, big film stars, sports stars. Today, there are a breed of young influencers and micro influencers. I want to get your perspective on how is this new breed of influencers and micro influencers 
adding value or creating a problem for brands? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, I mean, in some cases, I think it's a deeply unsatisfactory ecosystem. Mm. Because if people are recommending things simply because they've been paid to do so, mm. okay, that's highly problematic. Mm. Okay. But isn't um, that what sports stars and film stars are also doing? Uh, not entirely, in the sense that when you say bet on the jockey, there is an interesting thing, which is that the jockey knows more about the horse than you do. <laughs> okay. Assuming the jockey has some choice over which horse to ride, mm. okay, and assuming not unreasonably that the jockey wants to ride horses on which he or she can win, mm. okay, you're benefiting from two forms of information there. Mm. The past success of the jockey, but also the jockey's superior intelligence to yours mm. in terms of selecting a mount. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the case of, for example, really good recommendations, mm. where you can tell the people are specialists and highly reputationally invested in giving honest advice. Mm. Probably the most extreme case is a man called James Hoffman on mm. Coffee on YouTube. Mm. Uh, don't don't go and watch his channel because mm -hmm. uh, if you watch his channel for half an hour, you'll be suddenly contemplating spending you know seven hundred dollars <laughs> on a coffee grinder or something. Okay, okay. 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 Uh, I mean he's intensely perfectionistic. Mm. Maybe you disagree with his taste, but he's inarguably sincere. Mm. Okay. And so there can be cases where, if you like, the the right influencer or recommender, mm. if they are reputationally invested, so they're not actually going to... Re now, the first requirement is, by the way, we don't necessarily need a guarantee of perfection when we make a purchase. Mm. We want a guarantee of non-awfulness. Mm. And assuming that the, you know, that the recommender is not going to recommend something that's absolutely appalling mm. that may be a much safer assumption than the idea that the recommender is going to recommend something that's perfect mm. because someone with you know someone genuinely with skin in the game and with future intentions mm. okay that's it. um and, and by the way a very interesting thing i noticed uh which is um there was a restaurant in Seven Oaks in my local town, mm. which was closing down, mm. and they made the absolutely fatal mistake of putting up a sign saying last two weeks. Okay. In the hope that everybody would flock there for their last chance. Mm. Of course, instinctively, one goes, why would a restaurant that isn't going to trade beyond the next two weeks mm. care about pleasing the customer? Absolutely. Because the chance of them coming back is effectively zero. Yes. And, you know, obviously closing down sale, that works very well. We have mm. to get rid of this stuff, mm. okay? Mm. But the same thing applied to a restaurant, I think, had absolutely the opposite effect. Mm. And I think humans deploy so much social intelligence because mm. the reason we've got a big brain, okay, isn't to understand rocket science. Mm. Nature didn't give us a big brain so we could produce space shuttles or silicon chips or anything like that. It gave us a big brain so we could understand each other. Correct. And I always have this interesting thought, and I never know the answer to the question, because unfortunately, my late mother, having died, doesn't allow me to perform this experiment. But my mother didn't know anything about cars, but knew a huge amount about people. Mm. And I always ask the question, and we could do this experiment with someone else. Let's say you have two people and you send them out to go and buy a car mm. from one of 10 people selling cars. One person doesn't know much about people, but knows a lot about cars. Mm. The other person doesn't know a lot about cars, but knows a lot about people. Mm. Um, quite often, because our brain has particular strengths in understanding social dynamics, mm. we replace a technical question mm. with a social question. Mm. In other words, we use a proxy question that's easier to answer. Now, my mother, my mother wouldn't have known anything about the car being sold, but mm. she'd know whether the person selling it was basically trustworthy. Mm. Well said. And so it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting thing. And partly, I think, what we do is we personalise brands, mm. and brands can behave in a way that's trustworthy, future focused, Correct. reputation sensitive, Correct. all the things you want to see in someone who's selling you something. Correct. Or brands can behave in completely the opposite way. Mm. You know, I can keep speaking to you. It's such a fascinating conversation, but I only have time for one more converse, uh, mm. question. And I want to get your perspective on how communication is changing. You know, when I was growing up, big billboards, long uh, film advertisements, etc. Now there's this small handheld device and everyone's saying, 
communicate in seven seconds. How do brands communicate their uh, proposition in such a short period of time? Uh, one, should you? Okay. Uh, and and, and, and but the second thing is you can, hmm. but I worry that we haven't, with the gathering rush of digitization, hmm. I worry that we haven't alongside it invented hmm. the equivalent of long copy press advertising. Hmm. In other words, introducing you to something new and taking hmm. the time to explain why it's different. Hmm. Now, David Ogilvy quite rightly said that people make purchase decisions emotionally, hmm. but he also qualified that by saying that we also need a rational, and he called it rather brilliantly, excuse. So that if someone asks us why we bought the thing, we don't just go, mm, it felt good. Hmm. Okay, we can actually come up with some effectively post-rationalized or mm, you know mm. reverse engineered explanation you know mm. i bought the aston martin because of its superior luggage carrying capacity <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever it may be yeah. and i do worry i do worry now interestingly if you actually look at consumer behavior mm. in the round what you actually see is not a trend towards low attention spans and shorter and shorter communication mm. what you see and this is the best bit of advice i ever had from a futurologist it's mm. it's a vector mm that people now are free from the constraints of, let's say, TV programs lasting an hour, half mm -hmm. an hour, mm -hmm. uh, you know, songs lasting three minutes and so forth. People are going both long and short. Mm -hmm. And actually, don't forget that alongside this supposed attention span problem, mm -hmm. we also saw the advent of the box set binge. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody in Hollywood, or Bollywood for that matter, mm. anticipated that people would effectively sit down for five hours mm. and watch, you know, TV content you know, pretty much without a break. Yep. Similarly, I'm a huge devotee of YouTube. One mm. of the bits of advice I give to everybody is nobody has YouTube premiere, mm. um, but actually it's, um, or premium, I can never remember what it's called, uh, but it's actually worth buying. Yep. Because YouTube is now reaching a point where it's Wikipedia with video. Mm. In other words, the amount of content there is so enormous Correct. that rather than just watching what you recommend, you can actually search it for more or less anything. Absolutely. Well said. And, well said. and, 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 and so, uh, you know, one of the things I'd, I'd look at is, are we actually covering all bases? Now, mm. OK, if it's simply brand recognition, short term things can work, it's not a bad thing to do. Uh, you know, if you think about it, sponsorship mm. is a very weird case because it says absolutely nothing except mm. we've got a lot of money. OK. Correct. Correct. Um, so th th those things, ex those things have their role, but they're complementary. And the mm. problem is with marketing is instead of looking at, at the thing holistically, what mm. we tend to do is we tend to compartmentalize mm. and we put those things in opposition to each other, which I think mm. is a mistake. Mm. Very interesting. Rory, uh, you know, we've, we've far exceeded our time. I wish I could just carry on talking to you, but I do have to stop because Quite understood. Of the time, uh, you know, I, I think my conversation has been absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for speaking to me about your own personal journey. Thank you for speaking to me about your book, Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. Thank you also for giving me such amazingly different perspectives on branding and communication. Well, I, I'm in awe of you because I see India being the market and the Indian diaspora mm. being the marketing powerhouse of the world in 10, well, actually it already is to a degree, mm. Mm. but in 10 years time. And, yeah. you know, um, I, 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 I think there are a variety of reasons for that cultural educational mm. everything else mm. Mm. but um, i also see the level of interest in behavioral science mm. in india Correct. being spectacular yeah. so that absolutely gladdens me well i hope to see you when you whenever you visit india next and, i'm sometime this year i hope wonderful i hope so and uh, i'm looking at good luck for your book i'm going to uh, order a copy of uh, your book to understand a little more thank you pleasure. happy to come back anytime thank you thank very much you. indeed Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.